picture the scene. It's about 2006. I'm spending the majority of my time playing video games. My career is going absolutely nowhere. And I decide to go to a conference. But at the networking event afterwards, um, there was a free bar till 9 p.m., which was pretty good. I was stood there mingling, enjoying it, networking a little bit. I must have looked too happy because there's this guy who I called Mr. Freaking Furious after the event, of course, not to his face. He must have thought I looked too happy because he stomped right over to me, pinned me against the wall, talked right through me and started going on about how bad life was, how bad his career was, how bad the industry was, how he hated his manager, he hated the people he worked with, he hated the product he was working on, he hated everything. But he was so angry, I mean, he was not thriving at all. And it really stuck with me, it really resonated, it really upset me, actually. Uh, to be fair, he kept me pinned against the wall past nine o'clock so I didn't get to enjoy the free bar. It really, really dug home with me. I mean, he was the angriest man I've ever met and I thought, I don't want to end up like that. And so I wrote my name on a list, I wrote a whole load of things that I wanted to try and achieve and I went away and I did absolutely nothing with it. I played video games, I drove around in ridiculously stupid cars, but then there was a compelling event and I think we all have these in our lives. We don't have to wait for these, of course, and that's actually the point of this vlog. But this to me was the compelling event that made me pick up that list and actually do something with it. It was the birth of my first son. It was one of those moments where I was like, my goodness me, this small thing, it relies on me. It's, it sort of needs me to obviously provide shelter, food, safety, all of the, the usual kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom. But it also needed me to be a role model to show him what life is about and how you can make the most of it. So I dug out the list and I started working on it. And since then I've sort of thrived in my career. And what I want to do is share those ideas that I've learned on the way with you. And these are lessons that I've learned in the last 20 plus years. I know I don't look that old. And I hope they resonate with you and I hope you have a compelling event that kicks you into thriving in your career. But of course you don't have to. You could just make that decision now. And that's actually the first one of the 10. Moped. Cyclists. Man, this is busy here today. So many cars and cyclists. Um, feeling a bit self-conscious doing this video today. So idea number one is just decide to thrive until we make that decision. I guess we're forever pulled and pushed along by other people's agendas. We may end up surprised at where we actually end up. Is it where we wanted to be? Because if we don't make that decision about what we want in our lives, then the chances are we're unlikely to hit that target. Now, of course, just making that decision, writing that list and trying your hardest to execute executing those is no guarantee you're going to succeed but you stand a much better chance of being able to make the correct decisions being able to open up those opportunities and luck always comes for those that are prepared and know when to take that opportunity so how do you do this i have a three-stage process to this one is i write out a 10-year painted picture you want to write out what your future looks like not with all the fine details because they're the kind of things that don't really ever come to fruition but those big level things where do you want your career to be? Where do you want to live? Do you want to have kids and a family? Do you want to have a holiday home in Spain or whatever it is? It's not all about that materialistic possessions and salary and career titles. It's about what kind of person do you want to be in 10 years time? Do you want to be resilient and robust to the world that we live in and that's pretty chaotic at the moment? Or do you want to be, you know, super healthy, super fit? Do you want to be writing books? What kind of person do you want to be? Write that out, add some flavor to it, make it interesting, make it compelling print it out, stick it in front of you, keep referring to it. So part two of this is to have some five-year goals because the decisions we make right now will influence where we are in a year and where we are in a year will influence where we are in two, three, four, etc. So five to me seems like that logical number to start thinking about. When I look at the painted picture, halfway between now and that painted picture, what do I need to have achieved? Because the painted picture is never just going to happen overnight. We're going to have to do the hard work. So what does that hard work look like? Five years just seems like a really logical place for me to start of course come up with your own time scales but five works really well because it guides the decisions that I do now and it guides the decisions for step three which is one year goals so in one year from now what do I want to have achieved because the decisions I make today will affect that so for example I wanted to start blogging and I mulled it over waiting for the right time and I'll give you a clue there is never a right time to do things you just got to start so what did I do I started a blog and I started writing and of course no Everybody read the first few and then over time one two three four years started to build a pretty big 
audience. But the decisions that we make right now will affect where we are in one year because months fly by, years fly by. And it's really important that we're consciously making those decisions on where do we focus our energy? Where do we focus our attention? Because energy and attention, they get things done. So write out what you want in a year's time. Not too many, I'd say maybe three or four different goals and then start working towards that. What do you need to do today? How do you need to change? Because majority of the time to achieve our goals, we have to become different people. So there are the three things, but you've got to decide. If you don't make that decision point, then the chances are these things will never come to fruition. Step number two in how to thrive is to build relationships, to start working on relationships. When we think about the world of work, how does it work? It works in a series of relationships. We give, we take, we help, we support, we garner people around our ideas. And this can only happen with good, strong, positive relationships. So how do you build relationships? You build them one person at a time, face to face, ideally with really good communication with both of you meeting in the middle so that you're not accentuating those things that wind them up, that rub them up the wrong way. Now, if you're a manager, the relationships come from listening to people, to understanding, to working with them. You're not managing people, you're working with them. And that requires good relationships. With good relationships, you'll find doors open, you'll find opportunities open. Give you an example, I wanted to shift sideways from technology into human resources, and it helped by building really good, strong relationships with those people in HR, showing them that I had the ability, I understood the domain, and I had the experience that I could add to their team. And over time, when I was ready to make that transition, the door opened up because of that relationship. So how do we find new jobs? Relationships. The best way to get a job is to have a good relationship with somebody who works at that company, ideally the hiring manager. Now this isn't about being Machiavellian. This isn't about building a relationship just to take, 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 because that's not a relationship. This is about building a two-way symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic? Is that a word? You get the gist. A two-way relationship where you're giving and you're taking. Relationships are everywhere. And I see so many people go through their careers not worrying about them, not caring caring about them, actually destroying them with no thought for that long-term approach. Relationships, they open doors, they can help you thrive in your career. Have a guess, what's my favorite music? Country? No. Heavy metal? No. They're the two usual responses that I get to that question. The answer is, of course, hip hop. Anyway, one of my all time favorite bands is a band from the north of England, they're called Flame Griller. And the lyrics to one of their songs say something along the lines of, if you're not having fun with it, be done with it. We spend so much time at work that if we're not enjoying it, if we're not having fun, then it's gonna be a miserable existence. Now, of course, we can't manufacture fun in certain jobs and there'll be jobs we have to take just to sort of pay the bills, but this all depends on your season of life. Keep coming back to those goals. If you're in a job that's not satisfying, that's not enjoyable, then where are your goals? Are your goals setting you on a path to learning how to transition to a different career or boost your career by working through the ladder in the organization that you're in, becoming a manager, for example, or an executive. Maybe it's starting your own own business. Those goals should take you on a journey to something that is fun. I remember Paul Hawken in his great book, Growing a Business, said a business isn't something you do to live, it's something you live to do. And that can resonate whether you're running your own business or whether you're working in an organization. We've got to be having fun. But we wouldn't have fun if we didn't have the downside to it. It's a roller coaster. There's ups and there's downs. There's highs and there's lows. So we can't expect it to be fun all the time. But when you look at your daily work, you look at your week, you look at your month, you look at your year, if you haven't had the majority of that time being fun, interesting, engaging, entertaining, then chances are you're probably in the wrong career or the wrong job or the wrong company. So again, put that into a plan. Start building your skills, building yourself and start moving towards something that's more fun than what you're doing. Mm. 
When we join an organization, we have to trade some freedoms and some values at the doorstep. When we sign that contract, what we're signing up to is working in that organization, and that's gonna come with some compromises. So for example, the most obvious one is if you work for an organization that requires you to wear a suit to work every day or a smart outfit, that might be a freedom you don't wanna trade. You maybe enjoy sitting around in shorts and t-shirt or wearing jeans and a jumper, for example. So again, we've gotta think, that's a really obvious example, by the way, but it happens on all levels. Think about the methodology that the company used. Think about the market that the company operates in. Think about the company values. Think about the way that people are treated. Think about the technology that's used. Think about the location. Think about the salary. These are all kind of compromises we have to make when we join an organization. And I've worked with too many people who expect the organization to bend to meet their preferences, to keep them happy, to keep them satisfied, to shift entire company values to meet an individual. That's not how it works. So let's embrace this when we go and join an organization, let's have a look at what the values are, let's study the behaviors, let's ask questions, let's research the organization and your manager. Have a look at the product and the technology and the market and the way that they deliver this stuff. These are all things that we should be looking at before we take a job. Because trust me, if you work in an organization where your manager and the organization have different values to you, you're gonna have a horrible time. You're gonna spend your entire time fighting against what is natural to you. So this isn't about asking the organization to shift. This is about doing the research, finding organizations that resonate with your values. You're still always gonna have to compromise. And of course, you could always go and set up your own business, but trust me, over time, you're still gonna have to compromise on some things. Business is never as straightforward and as simple as we like it to be. So think about this the next time you're planning your career, you're thinking about a new job, or you're thinking about why maybe you just feel this constant sort of turmoil when you're at work. It could be that you're working in an organization that has different values to you. And I'll give you a clue, the values that they put on the posters on the wall, the values that they put on the website, they may not be the real values of the organization. I've seen this far too many times with trust, happiness, agility, confidence, support, relationships. These are all values that people pull out of a, you know, some sort of strategy guide or some sort of online document somewhere. They're not the values of the organization. If you want to know what the values of an organization are, you should be asking people who work there, doing your research, doing your study, and finding out how people get rewarded. How do they get promoted? How do they get the bonuses? How do they get the pay rises? These are really important questions to ask before you join an organization. Of course, the hiring manager probably isn't gonna tell you that, so this is about doing that research. So the next idea is all about shipping value and focusing on the customer. Because when we focus on the customer and ship value for them, we're gonna become a more valuable employee, at least to a manager that recognizes goodness. We wanna be adding value. We don't wanna be sucking value out of the business. We don't wanna be looking at business as just a means to get paid. We wanna be contributing to it, to the society, to the culture, to the customer. And when we start to add value, when we start to understand where value can be added in an organization, you should see your career thrive because frankly, you're gonna get lots more opportunities Opportunities. You're going to be trusted as somebody that understands business value, commercial awareness, and you're going to be trusted to deliver more and more and more. And with that more responsibility, yes, it can be stressful. Yes, it can actually be detrimental sometimes, but usually it'll give you deep insights to yourself, but it'll also give you a boost in your career. I see a huge amount of people in the world of work adding absolutely no value to the organization. They're not asking the critical questions and doing that skeptical thinking and doing the due diligence about the work to understand how this piece of work ties in with the business numbers that matter. To thrive in your career, you've really got to embrace everybody's differences. You've got to appreciate that when you go into an organization, there's gonna be a huge number of people who are different to you. So this is where DISC comes in, a wonderful tool for working out what your preferences are, how you like to work, and how you like to communicate. And of course, if everyone in your organization is doing DISC, then you'll have a rich picture of how people like to work. So when you bring a team together, you're gonna to understand that there might be some friction between, for example, the high Ds who are all go, 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 let's just action something and the S's who are maybe a little bit more steady, harmony, what about the people? Do we need to think through things properly? And the C's who are conscientious, they just want the evidence, the facts, the data. Why are we doing this? What does good look like? And then you've got the I's who are all about motivating and aligning and having a laugh and 
disrupting sometimes. This is how you build a good team, by embracing people's differences. It's also how you build those relationships. Work out yourself, work out the other person, and move more towards them. So for example, if you're a high D and it's all action, go, 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 and you're working with an S that's a little bit more harmony, slow and steady, wants some evidence, some facts to think through it, needs a little bit of time to contemplate things, then you have a clue. Don't just go in there and go, right, go, do this, do this, do this. That kind of intenseness, that kind of action orientation can actually be pretty stressful for some people. So you've got loads of clues and DISC is one of those wonderful tools. Always recommend it. It's really, really good at finding out what your preferences are, what your communication style is. And then the goal is to move to the other person. Pretty cloudy with the sun going in and out. It's probably affecting the light pretty bad here. I do apologize for that. I'm uh, obviously out and about, isolated walk and all that. So um, I'm trying my hardest. I'm still getting used to this camera. I'm still getting used to how to do these things. The autofocus I think I've managed to fix. You might have seen in some of the previous videos, it was a little bit sketchy. But lighting, oh, that's next. I'm on a journey. I'm still learning how to do these things. So bear with me. I hope you're enjoying these, by the way. I hope they are adding some value. I'm certainly learning a huge amount about myself and about the camera and about how to shoot these videos. Um, anyway, enough of the solo waffle. You're never going to thrive in your career if you don't learn. You've got to learn about yourself. You've got to learn about the business. You've got to learn about your industry. That is how we thrive in our career, by constantly learning. Now, I've done a video already on how to build a personal knowledge management system. Sounds super geeky. It's super is geeky. I am super geeky. I really love this stuff. But it's one of those tools that, you know, you can capture a whole load of information, but until you crunch it, until you assimilate it into your mind, until you accommodate it, until you push other stuff out that maybe isn't correct anymore, we're never going to get better. And that's the whole point of learning. And learning is about just getting better. It's about understanding more about ourselves, our world, other people, and then being able to move forward as a better person. And your management will never be more or less than you as an individual. So if you want to become a better manager, then you need to become a better individual. Now, of course, learning isn't just about personal development. It's, of course, learning about how the business works and getting better in the business. Every time there's a mistake in your team, you should hold your hand up and say, that's on me as a manager, because frankly, it is on you. And then we should learn from that mistake. When we don't learn from the mistakes, that's when we're not doing our job properly. There will always be mistakes. There will always be things that don't go as you planned. The key thing is to learn from it. And of course, if you're learning and you're a manager, then you're setting a very good example to everybody in your organization. You're saying to your team that it's okay to not know everything, that you're humble enough to realize that actually you're not complete. I like to break learning down into two different types. There's knowledge acquisition, which is about reading stuff, it's about acquiring facts. And there's very few people on the planet that can do that and then suddenly turn that into actual wisdom to knowledge that's inside yourself. So there's a second part to this, which is task acquisition. This is about taking that knowledge and then trying it. Because when you try it, you'll see the holes in it. You'll see the things that didn't work. You'll be able to mash together other ideas. You'll be able to come up with your own way of implementing this thing. That's proper learning. So be the manager, read something, study something, then tries it safely, carefully, and learns from it. So the last video I did before this one was how to be effective and liked. And of course, this is one of the steps here in how to thrive. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this. There will be links in the show notes below. But of course, our job is to be effective and liked. The best way to do this is to understand what the business actually wants you to achieve and that's being effective and there's a whole load of other things of course but I go into those in the other video and of course the other thing is not just to push people aside and leave a sort of trail of human devastation behind you so we've got to be liked at the same time and if you can balance those two things and know when to flex because we can't always be effective and liked at the same time then you're going to have a really really good future because you're going to be able to read the situation and you're going to be able to apply the logic that you need to you're going to be effective and hopefully at the same time, liked. So the next idea is to step outside of your job role. So when we join an organization, the chances are we're gonna have a job description. It's one of those HR things. We probably need it for many legal requirements. But actually, when was the last time you looked at your job description when you were going about your daily work? Not very often, I imagine. So we have these job descriptions. We have these things that sort of cages in the boxes that put us in this frame, but don't be restrained by it. In my experience, most of the problems in organizations, they exist between job roles. There's a problem here, not in my job description. It's not in their job description. 
either. So this problem just remains unsolved. So when we expand our frame, when we start picking up some of these challenges that exist between job roles, we not only get better in ourselves because we're learning new skills, we're learning how to do other bits and solve problems that we've never solved before, but we're also adding a huge amount of value to the business. Now be careful, you don't wanna be picking up work that someone else should be doing, that just needs calling out. But you should be picking up the stuff that exists between job descriptions. Now obviously there are things that we probably shouldn't be doing, immoral, illegal, dangerous, stuff that we're really frankly not employed to do. So we should challenge that as well. But fundamentally, let's expand our job frame, let's expand what we are here in an organization to do. The really effective employees, they're an absolute nightmare to write a job description for because they add so much value, they do so much stuff, they're constantly learning, they're constantly picking up new skills. And the most interesting part about this is you will become insanely valuable in the marketplace because you're able to solve problems that frankly no one else with that sort of niche job description or that industry title will be able to solve. You've been there, you've done it, you can talk the lingo, you can add experience to an organization. And with that experience, hopefully comes value. Family first. We should put our family first because there's no point thriving in our career at the expense of our family. Now the very first video I did for this channel is called The Pillars of Life. I'd encourage you to go and watch it because it's how you balance those different pillars that compete in your life. And the most important one of those pillars, well there's two really, one is health and one is family. Because there's no point having all this success and all of the money and the title or whatever it is that you're after in life if you've got nobody to share that with. Your family are uber important, trust me. I meet too many people who are divorced, who have kids that don't like them anymore, Anymore, that have relationships that are just in absolute tatters. And why is that? Because they've been measuring the wrong things. They've been focusing on career development. They've been focusing on job title, salary, car, house, all the other stuff that we sort of prize in the Western world particularly. But the one thing that they haven't focused on, the one thing they haven't measured, the one thing that they haven't put first is family. Now, of course, it's hard, but it's really as simple as just looking in your calendar for maybe six months to a year and putting in those things that are immovable and then building your work life around it. Now, of course, if you work for an organization, organization where you're not allowed to take an hour out, for example, to see the kids play, then again, that should be one of your goals to find an organization where that's not a problem. And there's a huge amount of organizations now that are insanely flexible. And actually, given the current climate that we're in, there's a huge amount more that suddenly have realized that actually people working from home, being more flexible with their hours is not a problem to productivity. Anyway, I hope you're thriving in your career. I hope these have been helpful. If you've enjoyed the video, let me know. Hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already to the channel so you're never going to miss one of these videos. Share it, of course, with your manager, with your friends, with your peers, with your colleagues, with your dog. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next video.